Okay, in this video what we're going to do is talk about basically using an Xbox 360 controller as our input device. So, first thing we need to do is take a look at the controller because, well, not everyone has an Xbox 360 or an Xbox 360 controller. Of course, you can go out and you can buy an Xbox 360 controller for your PC, just a regular USB version, or they do have the device now, Logan, that allow you to use a wireless, the wireless one as well. Link, so you can use all of the wireless original 360 stuff with your PC. Exactly. Now, we've got two uh, USB, so two wired uh, controllers here. So a really quick look at this, basically what we've got, left trigger, right trigger, left bumper, which you'll also see referred to as shoulder, so left shoulder and right shoulder. And then we roll around, look at the top. We've got the Xbox Guide button. We've got Back. We've got the Start button, the Y button, the X button, the A button, the B button. These two guys right here, we'll know them as two different things by the time we're done with this video. One, we'll know them as thumbsticks. So our thumbsticks left, thumbsticks right. Also, you can press them in as they are buttons as well. So we can call this left stick and right stick if we're referring to it as buttons. And then finally, we have our directional pad right here. So it's commonly referred to as a D-pad. Logan, anything else you want to talk about this graphic before we move off of it? Um, just to note that the only one of these buttons that you don't have available to you is the Xbox Guide button. Okay. Um, that's reserved for Microsoft's own use and isn't presented inside of the uh, XNA framework. Okay. But we do have access to and everything else. Everything else is fair game. Though. Sounds cool. All right, so let's go ahead and jump back over here real quick. And like we did previously, let's go ahead and create a new layer and hide this one out. And let's talk for just a minute about the gamepad's state. So, of course, here we are talking about gamepad. And we'd be calling on get state. Now, back in the very first video where we introduced the whole input device idea, we said that with the gamepad, this is where get state, the method, varied a little bit from the keyboard and the mouse. It actually took in which particular player gamepad you wanted to get the state of. So in this particular case, we'd do something like player index. Dot, one, two, three, or four. So let's say, in this particular case, we're wanting to do controller one. That's the one, only one we've got hooked up right now. So we would say player index dot one. Okay, so what does this return? Well, once again, it returns a state, and in our particular case, it's going to be a gamepad state. Now, what can be found as members inside the struct gamepad state? Well... Buttons. This is really simple when you just kind of look at it, just a, a quick overview of the members that are involved. And I'm not, once again, getting into every single member. I'm getting into the ones that we're going to be using most often here. D-pad for our directional pad. Is connected. Thumbsticks, and finally triggers. Okay, so like I said, just a real quick look at some of its more common members. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot that's available to us, but these are structs that break down themselves. So buttons, basically it returns a struct of type gamepad buttons, which is going to identify buttons that's been pressed. So let's take a look at, in this particular case, he returns a gamepad button. All right, so gamepad buttons, let's take a look at that one. So gamepad buttons. And what can we find inside of gamepad buttons? Well, this is going to look familiar very quick. Find things like the A button, the B button, the X button, the Y button, start, back, left shoulder,
left stick and just for sake of space I'll go ahead and say the right shoulder and the right stick just because we're running out of space here so again left shoulder left stick let's go ahead and jump back over here to the picture so left stick again it's a button so if it's pressed in and then left shoulder would be this left bumper over here let's go ahead and jump back over here so all of these guys all these members of the gamepad buttons struct they are all button states and you saw this in the last video when we were working with the mouse with the left and right mouse button being button states okay so next thing we have is the d-pad so what does the d-pad give us the d-pad gives us a gamepad d-pad it's a mouthful so game pad d pad and what can be found inside gamepad d-pad well the directional button basically what it's going to do the directional pad is going to more or less just their buttons okay so it's just going to be an up down left and right so up down left and right and like I said they're all buttons which means button states and once again the directional pad or d-pad all right so next is connected is connected is just a simple true or false that's going to indicate if it is actually connected if that controller is connected next are thumbsticks so what does thumbsticks return well it returns a game pad thumbsticks struct so game pad thumb sticks and inside the gamepad thumbsticks if you were to actually talk to it you would talk to rather is it going to be the left thumbstick or is it going to be the right thumbstick so inside the structure you're going to find members being left and right okay and now what types are these well, these are going to be vector twos, as I had actually mentioned in the very first video. And same thing, of course, applies for this guy, vector two. Why? Well, let's take a look at the thumbsticks. Up and down. So we can have X and Y axes. Okay. Right, the full up, down, left, right range of movement. Exactly. And that leaves only one triggers what does triggers return let's say and give myself a little bit of room I'll just go straight up above triggers is going to return a game pad triggers struct so game pad triggers and what are we going to find in here well we've only got two a left and a right And these are simple float values. So once again, if we come back over here to our graphic, so our left trigger and our right trigger float values, meaning how much are they pressed in. So we can actually gauge none at all, 50%, 75%, 100%. All right, so application that Logan's going to put together to demonstrate some of the more common gamepad elements that you're going to be using very simple app it's going to look something like this basically he's going to have two of those boxes drawn out and inside the boxes he's going to have crosshairs one of these is going to be for the left thumbstick one's going to be for the right thumbstick so as Logan moves the thumbsticks around you'll see these crosshairs move around so we'll see how we can actually get those set up graphically and then controlled and then we're going to have a series of smaller buttons a b x and y they'll all be evenly spaced a little bit better than my drawing here and then something that's going to be what i think is the most interesting part of this entire 
exercise I have these two wide buttons down here where we're going to have the left trigger and the right trigger and remember the left trigger and the right trigger what are they they're float values so it's not just an on or off it's going to be an actual decimal value in there and Logan's going to use that to show you exactly what the percentage is of the trigger is being held in so these are going to just be like little graph bars the more you hold it in the more it's shaded so if you hold it in 100 percent it's shaded all the way across and if you hold it in 50 percent well the shading will stop at 50 percent if you don't have it held in at all it'll just be open like the left trigger button right here that's being shown okay so very cool stuff so that is the game pad and the game pad state and a look inside of it at its members and those members how they represent all of these different structs the game pad buttons game pad d-pad Gamepad thumbsticks and gamepad triggers and what's found within them. So now let's see if we can tie all of this together into an application that gives us this as a final result. Logan? All right. Well, let's begin in a, uh, a fresh Visual Studio where I can begin a new project. So once again, a Windows game, and I want to call this project uh, Input Gamepad. And that will be our project folder. And before we can get into any of the fun stuff, we do have to uh, worry about gathering our assets and setting up the fields. So, um, and this one, let me start with the assets. I know in the last one that I had created some of the fields before I even got over to it. But uh, in this one, uh, I'll start with the uh, the textures folder, and we'll get our assets moved over. Okay. Uh, once again, this is going to be a textures folder within our project. And I'm going to need some texture, or excuse me, some files as assets. I've gathered these together in our working folder, including the sprite font, which is the exact same sprite font from the previous two lessons. Um, aside from that, we have more graphics this time. In addition to the uh, the button, the fill, we now have a box graphic, and that is that larger box that's going to hold the crosshair, as was drawn on the whiteboard a second ago. The crosshair graphic is going to be exactly that, the crosshair shown inside of the box. And finally, we have the trigger box, which is that wider box that we're going to fill for a percentage with the Xbox triggers. Okay. So I'm going to grab all of these assets, all of the files. I'm going to go back to my projects folder, where we now have the input gamepad project. Inside of that, of course, we have a textures folder that we created, and I'm going to dump all the files in, same as we've been doing in the uh, last two lessons. And we'll, of course, come to Visual Studio, add existing items to the textures folder, and under Content Pipeline Files, grab everything and add it in. Now, for the fields, since many of the fields are going to be, once again, similar to the previous lesson, similar to the mouse lesson, I still have that project loaded. As a matter of fact, I can switch over to it now, and if I scroll to the top of that project, you see I have things like a sprite batch, a sprite font, some texture 2Ds, and then the fore and back colors. So once again, I'm going to steal all of those and copy them into our new project. So this is back over to the new gamepad input project. I'll paste all of these. The sprite batch, of course, is going to stay. I'm going to keep the colors. And let me make sure that I have um, enough texture 2D references for all of our texture files. Uh, we have a button, which is the same as here. We have a fill, the same. We have we don't have a cursor now. Instead, we have a crosshair. So let me change the uh, the name accordingly to crosshair. And now I have let's see one trigger box. Yeah, one more field, one more texture 2D in addition to the last lesson, uh, and that is the trigger box, which I'll simply call trigger box for the reference name. And I think that's got it covered. We've still got a sprite font and everything here. Um, yeah. Okay. Next, of course, we need to remember to create the sprite batch when everything is kicked off and initialized. So very quickly, we'll jump in and add a new, or excuse me, create a new sprite batch, storing that in the sprite batch reference. And again, feed a graphics device, which is different than get hash code. So we'll feed in graphics device. Um, now we need to change our focus down to load graphics content. Now, since all these are the same repetitive lines, again, I am going to save a little bit of time by copying those once again from the input mouse project. Hang on one second. Scroll back up. I think we might be missing something up there. Let me just read these off. You've got box, button. Hang on. Let me switch back to the gamepad one because I had added the uh, – they're in a different order. 
Am I missing box? box by any that's chance? the one that's missing. Okay. Oh, we managed to completely skip box. Ooh, I feel better. That would have been fun to figure out later, <laughs> but yeah, good eye on that. Um, we also need one thing I managed to omit was this graphic. We have a box graphic, and I'll make a reference to that. There we go. All right. Now I should have sufficient fields, yes. I think. If yes, not, we we'll do now. now. Now the numbers line up. All right, so quick divergence, but now we're all, we're all set there. Um, now we can focus on load graphics content. And for that, I will switch back to the input mouse project just to save me some typing on all of these lines where I'm loading things, though I'm not going to copy the cursor one because I just have to change that. Uh, let me instead copy a handful of these lines into our new project. Font will remain the same. It's the same names all across. Button still exists. Fill still exists. New things are box, crosshair, and trigger box. So let me get uh, three new load lines for Texture 2D so that we can fill in our references for box with the box asset. can fill in crosshair for the crosshair asset. And finally, trigger box for the trigger box asset. And there we go. Okay. All right, that should take care of assets now. And at this point, we're getting very close to getting into the stuff that we can actually play with. Um, I think I'll do the same uh, same as I had before, and that is start the begin and end methods to sprite batch, just to get that out of the way. Okay. So we'll make our call to begin and a call to end and have the sprite batch set up. And let's see. One last method I want to steal from the uh, input mouse project was that draw button okay. procedure, or that draw button uh, method we'd put together. If we go all the way to the bottom, this is where we had adapted draw key to draw button to take in a button state. And as you pointed out on the whiteboard, we're going to be dealing with button states a lot with the Xbox controller. So I'm going to steal this entire method, jump back over to the input gamepad project, and paste that just below the draw method. So we have a draw button. We should have the same assets necessary to satisfy this. We still have a button and button and everything should work. Now that gives us something where we can very quickly go in and test the gamepad input to see if it's working. Okay. So now we'll change our focus over to the gamepad itself. How do we go about getting a gamepad state captured? Well, I need to make a uh, gamepad state variable so that I can use the values I get back. So I'll make a gamepad state variable. And I'll call it gamepad state for the name. And we'll set that equal to gamepad dot get state. Now get state, like you'd pointed out, is going to require a player index. Which of the four possible contr players controllers are we looking at to get the state from? I'm going to give it player index dot one because that's the uh, the only controller we have at the moment. But there you saw a quick flash with IntelliSense two, three, and four as we talked about. Uh, sure, let me take this. Uh, there we go. Yeah. We have up to yep. four possible players given by the player index. Okay. Um, we're getting the input from player one. And now we have that stored in a gamepad state. So very briefly, I could go in and just take a look at that gamepad state and see what is available. We see we have a buttons struct of type gamepad buttons. We have a d-pad type gamepad d-pad. We have the is connected. Uh, then we have thumbsticks, so there's the gamepad thumbsticks, and the gamepad triggers. We could very quickly jump into buttons and see that it is in of itself a struct, where we have A button, B button, back, left shoulder, sticks, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then at the very bottom are uh, X and Y values. So we've got buttons, we've got uh, D-pad, there's all of our D-pad, down, left, right, and up. We've got, just going through these quickly, uh, thumbsticks left and right and finally there was one at the bottom triggers we have triggers left and left right. and right so that is the uh, intellisense representation of that breakout you had drawn on the whiteboard but all that is interesting though i'm not going to be using those values directly with an if statement instead i'm going to jump into use of this draw button since we're looking for a button state we know we have those inside of a gamepad state so let's put the two together here I'm going to jump right between the begin and end for the sprite patch and make a call to draw button. And inside of draw button, I'm going to give the position. Um, since I have these laid out, I'm going to go ahead and position it where I want it on the screen for the final uh, display graphic. Okay. So I'm going to give it the position uh, as a vector 2 at 180 in X and 20 in Y. 
Now for the uh, button state, I want to use the gamepad state we've created, and I want to look into its buttons struct, and I want to pass along the A button. That will be the button state that I pass on to draw button. And finally we need a label, so I'm going to give it the label A for this button. And We can go so, ahead and just test right now. Yeah, build, and we have no errors. So let's run, and we're going to have the blue, the blue background. Yeah. No, we're going to have an error. Even better. Wide button cannot be found. Oh, I we had a wide button in the mouse example. Oh, yeah, that's right. Very good, not changing this back to button. <laughs> so allow us to do that. We'll change this. And change the color in. while we're in here. Yes. Uh, let's get that set up. Cornflower blue to black. Because we know we've had those foreground colors set up to work on a black background. So with those two changes now, let's run. Much better. And there we go. An A button kind of floating out in space. And your player one light on your controller just lit up. They can't see that, but just pointing that out. Um, so now looking at the A button, if I press the A button on the controller, it lights up. So we are receiving input from the Xbox 360 gamepad. Very cool. So that's really it for a button. I mean, not only was the button just a simple check of pressed or released, as we can see here inside of draw button, looking at button state are pressed. Um, and it's the same button state as used as a, in the mouse. So, I mean, same idea between there. So we could go ahead and just copy that draw button line and paste it three more times and offset everything by about 30 pixels in X each. Uh, sure. So 210 and so 240, 240 and 270. 270. And then just change it to B, X, and Y. All right, we've got B, X, and Y. Um, update the labels to B, X, and Y. Um, and so we can get our four button grouping in place. So A button, B button, X button, and Y button. Beautiful. Or pretty much any combination thereof. Fantastic. Including all of them. <laughs> Very nice. So that's, yeah, that's uh, buttons. Okay. Now I believe we can turn our attention over to the uh, the thumbsticks. Sounds get good. A full, what could be considered a joystick axis going all right. for us. So let me begin a new method for displaying a uh, an axis. I'm going to call this method uh, draw thumbsticks. So this will be a private method, uh, still returning nothing, so a void. And I'm going to call this draw thumbsticks. Or just draw thumbstick one at a time. Uh, well, I've drawn a thumbstick, and there's two things I want to take in two vector twos. One vector two for where on screen should this box be displayed, and the second vector two for the actual input given by the thumbstick. So I'm going to call this. Uh, Vector2 position, and Vector2, what I'm going to call axi, and this is just more from the old terminology of a joystick axi. Though I guess to be completely correct, that would be both X and Y. I mean, we could name this thumbstick. Oh, that's right? good. Because, I mean, this is both axes. But that's right. It's a variable. It's a Vector2. I happen to call it axi. <laughs> and there you go. could call it hamburger if you'd like. Um, so... Now we need to worry about exactly what kind of input do we get in this vector 2 and what's, what's its range. So before I even worry about the graphical display of the button, let me just dump out the value of that, uh, that vector 2, just okay. so we can see directly what's in it. So all I'm going to do in here for the time being is they call the sprite batch draw string, and then using the font field, I'm going to draw the text axing.toString. So we just get a direct representation of whatever values happen to be in the axis, And the position all just feed along. As a matter of fact, let me make a uh, new position. Vector 2. I'm going to set this at 0 even if it mm -hmm. doesn't align because this is, is just for a uh, temporary purpose. Sure. And I'll use the uh, the 4 color for drawing this. Then back in, uh, in draw, let's see. I'll put the call to this thinking before or after. Probably before. Before. I'm going to put in a call to our new uh, draw thumbstick method and put in some positioning. Um, I will go ahead and drop this positioning in just so I don't have to worry about changing it later. And that is this first box is going to be set to a vector 2 of 20 by 20. And the thumbstick that I wish to send, or the axis from gamepad state dot thumbsticks dot left. We'll handle the left thumbstick first. Okay. And that's it for the call. Now this call right now should only display whatever value was stored in the left thumbstick given by axing. So let me build just because there's been a few things put together and then run. So we have what's showing now is a X and Y of 0 and 0 for the uh, left thumbstick. If I begin to move the left thumbstick up and down, we can see the uh, Y value starting to change. 
and take note of the, uh, the direction that it changes. If I move the y axis up, we see this value increase, and I'm sometimes hitting a little bit of x, so that's why it's jumping. But as I move the y axis up, we can get all the way up to a maximum value of 1 in y, moving up. Or moving down, we get negative values. So moving the thumbstick all the way down in the y axis gives us negative 1. Now the uh, x axis, moving it to the right, gives positive values up until 1, and moving it to the left gives negative values up until negative 1. So that's the range that we're dealing with, okay. just, just to keep that in mind. And with that in mind, knowing roughly that we're dealing with ranges of negative 1 to 1, and then 0 being the center, let's put together a routine for drawing out the, uh, the joystick graphic, the box with the crosshair centered inside of it. So, let's see. Just to get the box drawing out of the way, let me jump down and add in a call to sprite batch draw and draw the uh, box graphic at the given position by the position parameter and uh, draw it with the uh, foreground color. So I'll put it four color. And we can go ahead and take that draw string out. Um, yeah, we can take it out completely since we know what the values yeah. are. And just to show this really quick, that means we now have a box aligned. Very cool. Now, the next thing we want to do is to draw a cursor at a position represented by the position of the, uh, the actual thumbstick. So let me put in, actually, below that, a called the sprite batch dot draw, where we'll draw the uh, crosshair graphic at the, um, for now, I'll directly plug in the uh, axis position. <laughs> Which goes from negative 1 to 1, so, yeah. <laughs> Let's see where that's uh, actually laying on screen now. Um, if we run and look, we have the crosshair graphic in the top left of the screen. Now show them how little it moves. So if we move up. Ooh, one pixel. One pixel, so we just... Oh, up. there's your little flickering from the... Because, uh, yeah, we have the... Uh, subframe. The so it kind of goes fuzzy in sub between pixel. frames for all the... Yeah, yeah. sub-pixel filtering. Woo! I mean, movement, but by one pixel, because, well, we all, we've already seen the values are on negative one to one. So we better do some adjustments so to axis. We need to account for that. So... Um, let me give a uh, let me multiply the uh, y value to give uh, some increased range. I'll do a, a hard coded value, then I'll plug in something that will actually make it fit the, uh, sure. the thumbstick box. Um, since I haven't defined uh, this parameter as constant, I'm just going to use the parameter directly and change it. Okay. That means I could do things like axi times equals I don't know 60. Okay. So now when we run, we get to move 60 Woo. pixels in any direction. Now, something to remember is that when we had the, the numbers up showing the actual position that this was drawing at, mm -hmm. remember that Y, pushing up on the thumbstick, meant Y went positive. When Y goes positive in screen space, it goes down. That's right. So what we're actually dealing with now is um, when moving the thumbstick up, the crosshair moves down and so vice versa. Invert it. So down moves up. So we need to invert the thumbstick. So uh, I can do that. Since we're modifying this axi parameter, I can do that by something like uh, axi dot y times equals negative 1 and simply invert it. So now moving down physically makes it move down on screen. So now moving the stick around in 2D space feels correct for the result that we're getting. So now we can worry about positioning it inside the box. I'm going to put off the exact spacing until we see where we need to get that from. Okay. Let me move down and uh, offset it so that the cursor um, actually resides inside of the, uh, the, the actual box. And I'll do that by just offsetting it by position. So we'll do axi plus equals the uh, position. And then we should see, mm -hmm. well, it's inside the box, but not quite far enough. Yeah, it's we need to apply some further offsets to get it dead center by default. But we now can, we need to take into account the width of the box and even the width of the cursor itself. Right, because in order to center this, we go back to the whole find the width divided by 2 and then offset again by the cursor's own width divided by 2. That's right. So let's get some of those calculations in place. So we know that this position got us to top left. We need to apply some further positioning them. And I'm sure this could all be done on one line to save on instructions, but it would make it harder. Oh, you're to just save. slowly building this up so everybody can see exactly what's happening. All right, so let's take a look at... Um, at offsetting it for the width. Um, after we position it, I'm going to take the axes x and increment that by the boxes width divided by 2 minus the crosshairs width divided by 2. And these are, ob of course, box and crosshair being the texture 2D mm -hmm. references to, uh, to each one. There was no parenthesis, instead I need a terminator. 
and that should have the final offset for x. And now we need to do the same thing for y. So I'll copy the whole line, paste it in, and change x to y and width to height. So now if we run, we should have a nice centered x. Hey. Now the range I had set up was a hard-coded value of 60, which is obviously wrong because we can move the crosshair outside of the box. Now looking at it, uh, just immediately you would think, well, we want a range that fits the width. So let's plug in the, uh, the width for the, uh, the overall offset. So instead of this hard-coded value, let's do something like uh, box.width, because that seems like it might work. But that still lets us go outside, because what's happening is, remember, it's not a 0 to 1 value, it's a negative 1 to 1 value. Right. So that's an overall range of 2. So yep. we actually need to, to divide that by 2 if we wish to keep this inside of the range of the box. So I'll actually take that uh, box's width divided by 2. But then if we run this, there's another thing to consider, even more offsets. Now we're locked to the box, but we're locking to the center of the crosshair. We're not taking into account that the crosshair itself has width. So we need to subtract off the crosshair's own width as crosshair dot width divided by 2. So now we pretty much hit the edges. Though, I mean, the edge pixels are hitting the edge pixels of the box. So really, I could pull that in knowing that that border is about 2 pixels. I could pull out another minus 2 pixels out of the whole alignment. And now we have what looks like a clean snap to the edge of the box. Very nice. You'll also notice that I'm using width to apply to both x and y here. Since I'm not specifying the x or y component, I'm applying this calculation to both. And that's relying on this box being a completely uh, perfect square box. If we had a rectangle for some reason, I would need to account for y separately in a manner uh, same as here. I would need to duplicate this line, reference x and y individually, and then apply the height to y. But since it happens to be square, I'm going to leave the single calculation and have fewer lines of code. Yeah. And really, it's looking at that to, result... Yeah, we're ready to go ahead and put the uh, right thumbstick in now. Yeah, that's, that's the proper result. Now that this method is working, it should be a simple matter of a second call to draw thumbstick. This time offset a little bit more in x. We'll set its x to 100 by 20. And the thumbstick we're interested in is thumbsticks.right. So now we have the right thumbstick, which is different than the left thumbstick. Ooh. So now we can move the thumbsticks around independently, and everything's working. Very nice. So it's like an uh, old-style calibration screen, except for dual thumbsticks. Okay, so that leaves only one thing, and that's for us to get some of those gauges in for our left and right triggers. Okay. And once again, I'm going to do that as its own method, so that we can keep everything packaged and display multiple ones easily. So what I want to do now is set up a method that I'm going to call draw trigger. And draw trigger is going to need to take in the position as all of these uh, displays have taken in, and it's going to need to take in a float to tell it how much it should be filled, basically how full should the gauge be, and also take in a label because we had them on the uh, the whiteboard labeled as L trigger and right trigger. Mm -hmm. So I'll need to take in a string label. So actually, you want to if you want to do a quick demonstration on the whiteboard, we could just come over here and say that the big thing is in pulling this off down here is that we're going to basically start out by filling an area and then the next thing that you're going to do is draw in the frame so we'll say that's about 50 percent there and then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to draw in your text Exactly. It's, uh, same order. As a matter of fact, it's going to be drawn in the same order as the original um, digital button. Mm -hmm. The only difference is here is it acts as a gauge so we can have only a portion of the area filled instead right. of the entire thing. Exactly. Okay. So with that in mind, let's jump back and let's begin this method. This is going to be, uh, once again, a private method. It's not going to return anything. And I'm going to call it draw trigger. I'm going to take in a vector2 for position a float for the uh, value, uh, the value of the gauge, if you want to call it that, and the string for a label. All right. Now let me get the, uh, the more simplistic draw calls out of the way so I can draw in the trigger box frame and then the textual label. Okay. So the first calls will be a straight batch draw where we're drawing in the uh, trigger box texture. We'll draw that at the given position. 
and then I'll draw it using the foreground color. So I'll grab four color, and that's all we need there. Now the uh, text label is going to be drawn on top of it. So I'll make a call to sprite batch dot draw string. Drawing with our font, we'll draw out the text held in the uh, label. And now I need some additional offset, because just like we had done in the simple button, the uh, text, if aligned to the very top left of the box, simply wouldn't look good, so I'm going to put a custom offset in. So this will be in the form of a new vector 2, where I take in the given positions x, and add about 20 pixels to that, and then take in the given positions y, and maybe subtract one pixel from that. Again, he's just simply aligning the text inside a box that he already knows the size of. And uh, this will, again, be drawn in the uh, foreground color. Let's go and put that uh, comma in there, too. Oh, yeah, that would be probably necessary. There we go. And there's that comma. All right, so we can go ahead and put both of these, a call to creating both these, since we're going to represent both the left and the right. Sure, we could go ahead and put the calls in place mm -hmm. so we have the uh, the display finished up here. Um, let me jump in below the uh, the gamepad buttons, and let's put in a call to draw trigger. Draw trigger is going to take in a position. I'm going to specify that with a vector 2, and the position values are going to be 180 in X and 46 in Y. The value for the, let's call this one the, the left box, the value is going to be held in the gamepad state, under the trigger struct, and it will be given as the left value. And as we can see here, that is indeed a float value. And then finally, we have the label, which I'm going to give as L trigger. That R got by on you. L and L, yeah, wrong. There we go. R got capitalized. All right. And with that call, let me copy it, duplicate the line, and set the uh, lower box to have a Y value of 72. Then we're going to be grabbing from the triggers right and call the box R trigger. Now we can go ahead and test it out and make sure we still have boxes. Yeah, very nice. So L trigger and R trigger. Obviously not filling, but we haven't coded in the uh, the fill portion yet. Okay. So let's jump down now and let's finish off draw trigger. Now this is going to be similar to the uh, to the fill from the draw button. As a matter of fact. Let me review that one really quick, because we're going to be setting up something similar. The idea with the fill was, again, make a rectangle starting at the position X and the position Y, but give some offsets so we don't draw over the corners, mm -hmm. and then use a width and height, and then pull back from that a little bit. And the key here is we drew an entire width. The difference with the gauge style of drawing is that we want to draw a percentage of this width. That's right. So let's begin by getting that same scenario going down and draw a trigger. Um, since there's more things I need to calculate, I'm going to define a separate rectangle variable okay. before I actually use it. So let me get a uh, rectangle, and let me call that fill rect. Go ahead and cap it. Yeah, thank you. Make that look better. There we go. And we'll set that equal to a new rectangle, where the rectangle's position x is going to be... Um, position exactly like above. Yeah, exactly like above. The position dot x plus 1 casted to an integer. And then below that, we need, again, casted to an integer. Yeah, the bottom line is we know exactly where this is going to start from. We know exactly how tall it's going to be. We just have to calculate how wide it's going to be. So here's the width, which I'm temporarily going to leave as question marks, because <laughs> I'm going to get back to that. I nice. want to finish off the call to the, uh, the height. So the height is going to be the uh, height of the trigger box. So trigger box. Because it's height property. And then we'll subtract off two. We'll take off two because we know we need to do the uh, minus two to counter one, the uh, pulling, shrinking by one pixel, and then two, countering the, uh, the offset given here. Now, the question is what to fill in for the width. Well, we want to start with the trigger box's width, so I could fill that in to begin with. If I gave trigger box dot width and then minus two, that would give an entire complete fill, and this would duplicate the results of the standard draw button uh, method. Mm -hmm. Now what we want is a percentage of this. The value given in float is a percentage. As a matter of fact, just to prove that before I plug in that value, let me do a temporary call to draw string so that I can draw out this float value, because I don't think we've actually looked at that in action before using it. Sounds good. Um, let me draw it using the font, and there's our font, so let's draw out the value to string. Let's draw this at vector 2.0. This is only temporary. 
and draw using the four color. All right, good. We run. Now there is our numeric value. This is linked to the right trigger. Actually, it's both of them, but uh, overdrawing isn't a problem at, at the moment. So let's watch the value go from uh, zero, and then as I add or uh, push the trigger in more, we increase to a maximum value of one. And let me comment out that other one. The the problem is both yeah, of them are drawing them are over each other. Let me comment out the left one temporarily, so that when I reach a value of one, there we go, one. Okay. So that is the range we're dealing with in zero to one, which is actually very convenient because if we use that value as a percentage. And let me uncomment this. If we use that value as a percentage, we could simply multiply that against something like a total width. And that would give us anywhere from 0 to 100% of the width and by multiplying it uh, by that value. So we could take the trigger box's width times value and then the obligatory minus 2 pixels to make the final offset work properly. So this can go from anywhere from 0% of this width to 100% of it. And of course, now we need to, before we build or anything, let's go ahead and convert that because value is a float. Oh, so if I build, we'll have a nice explosion because yep. we need to cast this. Let me think of how I want to run it. I'm going to do the cast after everything is applied, get the final result, cast the float. To an end. Uh, oh, yeah. The rectangle. <laughs> Casting the float to the float to still make the rectangle mad. And we'll go ahead and delete the uh, drawstring line. And, uh, yeah, drawstring was entirely temporary. And we can go ahead and add back up above the other one in. Actually, we need another call to draw. Um, because, oh, yeah, because yeah, we're I, not using it I yet. I made a rectangle <laughs> and then simply discarded it. Yep. So Let's use that rectangle. It would not be a bad idea to go in and draw and our draw. fill. So let's draw. This is going to be drawn using the uh, fill texture. And we have a destination rectangle prepared as fill rect. And we're going to draw using the Back four color. color. Oh, yeah, excuse me. I was so happy with the four color. Um, yeah, that's that's right. The back color represents the any of the, uh, the fills. I could have almost called it fill color thinking about it. Yeah. But, um, but that there works. We go. So the, the call is simple. We can build. Now we run. So let's watch the uh, right Ooh. trigger. So as I press the trigger now, that value, that 0 to 1 value, is now represented by a percentage of a fill for mm -hmm. the actual graphic. So, yeah, I've uncommented both of them. So there's the Very left nice. trigger and the right trigger, mm -hmm. or both triggers to some varying extent. So really, that's I think that's it. That's got both of the thumbsticks both working. All of the buttons, well, not all, but I mean the ABXY. All of the other buttons would be the same type thing, including the D-pad. You mm -hmm. just have to drop into the D-pad struct, and then everything held within our button states. And finally, the triggers. I mean, they have back is set up by default, isn't it? If you go ahead and just hit back, yeah, exit out. Just as an example, if you uh, if I wanna move could up point that to, out. Yeah. In update, you'll notice when building a new game from the Windows game template, you're given this these two lines, and that is a check for gamepad.getState for the first controller, for the back button to be pressed. And if that's the case, it tells the game to exit. There you go. So there it is comparing it against an actual pressed state. So this is using it with an if statement, which is nice. So now you've seen it that way as well, because we've just been passing the button state. It's, it's also using the state in line. It's not remembering the state to that's, a variable before use. That's very true. So it just shows you one more way that you can go about using one of the uh, actual controller elements. So that's it. I mean, we didn't show you every single um, thing that you have available over here, but it, at this point it really would start to become we, repetitive. We have shown all of the different types of inputs. Right. That is, the vector 2 you can get from a thumbstick, the button state you can get from a button, and the float you can get from a trigger. Exactly. So with that, let's go ahead and jump back over here, and I do believe if we turn this off and come on back down here to layer 3, that, yeah, that wraps this up. So that concludes the introduction to input devices in X and A. Now, of course, we're going to continue working with input devices now as we start creating our games. We're going to, well, we're going to need them in every game that we create. And uh, so, yeah, at this point, everybody should feel comfortable working with them. And I guess all that's left in this whole XNA framework section is just the knowledge review. So we'll be hitting you with a knowledge review in the next video. Thanks a lot.